All right, welcome. Class four, we're almost halfway there. Systems, okay. So, um, so we, you know, we've talked about some of the legal stuff. We've talked about some of the weather, <clears throat> how to look at weather. And now we're finally getting to the aircraft some. Um, tonight, we're gonna look at uh, basic components of the outside of the airplane. We're not gonna go into uh, any heavy aerodynamics tonight. We'll get into that next week. Um, and uh, but we'll start looking at instruments. And um, so you're looking at a picture of the uh, <clears throat> the Schweitzer SGS 233 Alpha there. Um, this is me on my solo day uh, coming in for landing. And at the bottom here, you can see a bit of the, in uh, the instrument panel. And um, we'll we'll get into uh, what each of these instruments do and um, and how to read them and uh, answer any questions that you have. Again, we're coming to you live from the Wildwood Academy. We thank them. And, uh, like a, any good airplane, we'll, we'll leave it as we found it or in better shape. Um, we thank the SSA for letting us use their webinar software to record this. And um, I'm with, uh, again, I'm Mark Stanfield with the Hood River Soaring Organization. Okay, next slide. All right, so we're, I've always presented this as we're always li looking from a, a standpoint of risk management of how we're going about um, flying for the day. And uh, so we've talked about, we've looked at what affects the pilot and uh, affecting I'm safe. We've talked a little bit about the paperwork for the aircraft and aero. We've talked about our environment. And so now we're coming back to the aircraft and uh, as I kind of might as well tie this into, you know, we're pre-flighting the aircraft. So let's start looking at all our instruments and things like that. So here we are, if we were in the PTS, um, the examiner would be talking about task C, this part of your operations of systems. Again, it exhibits knowledge of the elements related to, they wanna know that you can exhibit knowledge uh, of, related to the operation of the instruments and systems, including as appropriate. So when they say as appropriate on actual test day, they can only test what's on the glider that you're using for your check ride. Okay. So there's a lot of things here. They they kind of list a whole mouthful of things there. But if your glider doesn't have it, they're not going to test you on it that day. There's a few things they could ask about. Um, so, you know, these first basic five things, magnetic compass, yaw string or inclination, inclinometer, airspeed indicator, and altimeter, variometer, total energy compensators. Um, those are pretty standard on most of the training gliders you're gonna see. So that's all gonna be fair game. Gyroscopic instruments, we, I'm gonna cover that for just a minute. That's more gonna be on your power stuff or a motor glider, or if you got a fancy glider with avionics and it's in there. Um, Electrical system, you may or may not have that in your glider. Um, landing gear and brakes, uh, again, avionics, high lift and drag devices, um, oxygen equipment. Um, so that's what we'll be covering today. Sorry for my sniffles. So uh, when I went through my commercial check ride, uh, the DPE Mike Bamberg showed me this nice little system study. And um, and so when you kind of start to look at systems, I kind of like this. Think about what is it, you know, and that's like rote learning, right? And then we get into how does it work? And um, and then we really start to, a little bit of understanding there, and we start to understand it even more when we think of how does it fail? Um, and then correlation of learning is like, how do I know when it fails, right? And uh, And then now what, right? Now it's failed, I know it's failed. What am I gonna do? Fortunately, um, in gliders, it's uh, sometimes, it's most of the time, it's no big deal. You know, we we never, you know, as soon as we get off that hook from the tow plane, we know we don't have an engine. Whereas like when you're training in planes with power, um, the engine quits and it's like, now what? Um, okay, so I'm gonna, um, Briefly, just kind of go through a little bit because uh, there are a couple people that have never been in uh, a glider or an airplane. And so I'm briefly going to just kind of hit each component of the plane before we really get into the instruments. Because when th this subject, even though it talks about operation of systems, 
for a glider, it's mostly instruments, right? Um, so the cockpit, know it, learn it. Um, and when I say that, uh, when you go to do your checkout, get a good look for instruments. I mean, the, the instructor or whoever's giving you the checkout is going to really point out everything. But feel free to ask questions and get a kind of get a feel for the way they flow from left to right. Um, and uh, like for us, um, training in Big Orange here, it it doesn't have a radio, but you can. You, you can take a handheld so start to get comfortable with where you're going to put that handheld because now that becomes a movable object in the cockpit that's a little bit awkward or you know some type of little knee board or just post-it note um, and so start to start to contain your stuff so it's not spread out so much um, learn where the placards are and what's on those placards spend some time with it whenever people are giving me a checkout or I'm just checking out a glider and I know it's I'm gonna fly it or an airplane. I'll just get my cell phone out, take several pictures of the the uh, the control, the instrument panel, and the placards, and just kind of, so I can kind of go home and look at those um, later if I need to. So, and then the seats, um, adjust it for fit, right? And uh, and some of you are small. Um, some of our gliders, like, you know, you're going to need to use cushions, you know, make sure you kind of always have those cushions gathered up for you during when it comes time for you to fly. So a little bit what I'm talking about is already how do you manage yourself on the airfield with with, you know, an instructor and all the other action going on. So just kind of, as you know, your time's coming up. Make sure you kind of have all your stuff fit uh, with you um, when you get in those seats. Uh, most most. A lot of the gliders are already locked, but some of them move around. But you want to jiggle and make sure that if you hit flight or when the when the tow plane goes to take you, um, you're not gonna it's not gonna come loose or you're not gonna fall back and um, cause some type of accident, right? So um, some of this is a little bit common sense, but you know if you're not used to working with a certain plane or it, being in one. Um, it's definitely worth spending the time to just kind of see how you fit seat belts. Make sure they're you got them really strapped down because uh, in case you get into some thermal activity or bumps, which we often do with Hood River, um, and and then also make sure that just seat belts and straps aren't getting tied tangled around your feet or around the controls or anything like that. Um, questions about any of this so far? Okay, so when when you you know, kind of your first control instrument you're going to really get to is the stick, right? And it's just a mechanical lever that's going to like with with either pins and wheels or wires and pins, racks, rack and pins. It's going to it's going to move the aileron ailerons on the plane if you move it left or right, right? And so this is a this kind of works as a good model for the 233. But if you move the stick left and right. It'll move the ailerons on the outside. It's a French word for little wing, if for those of you that don't know. Or sorry, yeah, little wing. And um, and when you move it, you know, say free and correct. Say say your say your checklist things out loud to yourself. You know, it's a good habit to start now. When you're flying with me, I'm gonna make you say them out loud anyway. But if you know, and then actually when you're doing it, make sure you actually see. Yeah, that thing's moving, and it looks like it's right. Um, and that they're free from the seat belts, especially two seat gliders. Um, um, you know, there's been there's been people pulled the glider out, and they're getting in, and the back seat belt still wrapped around the the glider controls, um, and that could that could cause an accident. Um, so we don't want to see we don't want that to happen, right? So pedals down on your feet. Make sure that once you get comfortable with your seat that the pedals can fit and so, you know we'll help you with that but make sure that they fit and they're comfortable um you know you got a nice bend and that they're adjusted okay so it's worth spending a little time just make sure that you're comfortable so that when you're trying to fly and learn that uh, you're not dealing with all this other stuff that you could have dealt with on the ground and don't be in a rush right there's no such thing as an emergency takeoff you know there's emergency landings but Really, no such thing as an emergency takeoff. Um, ballast or weights, uh, if you have to use those, like you'll probably have to use them. You're a little like me, um, Gideon. You have to use them. 
make sure they're they're in and they're locked. You know, if they're not in, you're not meeting that weight. The the glider can start porpoising down the runway and um, cause an accident. Um, but um, and then the canopy. This is uh, canopies. They're expensive. Um, and so, I mean, keep them clean. Only use cleaners on them that you've asked, you know, knowledgeable club members about, about cleaning them. And then always keep them shut and locked. Um, if you're, if you open one and you're holding it open, make sure somebody is staying on it because the tow plane could come by and come up and create some wind that would cause it to, to open up and break off or just just you know how the cross winds here get anyway so we're really protective of our canopies okay um so just some of this is a little bit of etiquette about you know before you get out on the field and and, uh, and if you haven't been around it or haven't been told you don't know so until we either read something or are told by somebody we just don't know questions about any of that <clears throat> so um our first little our first little guy here is the uh, let me let me get my little pointer. I like my little pointer. Okay, here's our our toe release in the 233, and that's just simply a red knob that you grab your hand around and you pull to release the toe knob when you want to release. And um, over here on the left, I show you what a Schweitzer ring looks like. This is and down here beneath the the toe knob is that is a Schweitzer hook system, and that that is looks exactly like ours on the 233. And um, so, when you go to get this hooked up, um, the ground person that hooks that up, they will have you test it. They'll hook it up. You'll close the you'll close the release. They'll pull on it, make sure it's connected, and then they'll have you pull on it to release it. So there's two main systems in um, there's Schweitzer and then there's the toast toast system and the toast is uh, on most new modern gliders, uh, high performance gliders. It's more of a European system. Um, this is a picture of our L33 on the bottom and uh, it has the toast system. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And. Uh, They're both great, reliable systems. They're just different makes, and um, they're not compatible. Um, and here's the toast toe ring, and uh, it's down here too, but I just thought this was easier to see. This smaller ring here connects into a claw in there, and uh, which is the same claw system as on, at the, in the nose of the L33. Um, so if that fails, there's a there's a you would as a glider pilot like you can't release let's say from the tow plane you would move out to the left and rock your wings okay and and then what ha would happen there hey Corey what would happen there is that you would the tow pilot would hopefully be able to cut you loose um, our tow plane actually has a guillotine and so it could cut loose cut you loose. Um, a tow plane that doesn't have a guillotine would have a hook system like you on the other end, and there is a possibility that it wouldn't get wouldn't be able to to uh, release. Which then you would get this symbol here from the tow plane where he would the, he or she would fish tail her uh, the well the tail of the plane, and um, and then at that point you the both of you would just try to break it by snapping or you do a, a land together but we're not going to talk really about my operations tonight this is more about instruments so any questions about this um some operations are some aren't and uh, some of the gliders that the radios don't work that great um um ours works pretty well uh, well our current tow plane doesn't work it depends on sometimes it depends on the day uh, the the radio doesn't work that great but it's also it's it's an old um the pawnee is an old spray plane and it's pretty drafty so when it's on high speeds there's a lot of noise in there and this mic noise and it just it doesn't it's hard to hear it's hard to hear so and um and a lot and a lot of these um 
signals all came from earlier days when they're just radios weren't exactly um you know the commercial operation down in uh, arizona they don't use radios at all no no one i mean the the nicer gliders have them but the tow plane doesn't have a radio um but great question it looks like there's a question down here what is going on ian he was here in the sound i think we're all good now ian thanks okay he's on it okay all right um we'll move on to the next <clears throat> ah okay first faa question you can see on your written through an easy one here which illustration is a signal that the glider is unable to release all right i wonder and it is 10. okay all right so wings again like i said this is a just an overview tonight we're not going to get into aerodynamics um, this week that'll be next week so and for those of you that have never been in an airplane or around the gliders or anything um, the wings here you can see the wings of our of big orange and uh, and on the out outer edges on the back are your ailerons remember earlier I said the stick and the ailerons control the roll of the glider around the longitudinal axis okay so if I throw the stick over to the right it's going to shorten the camber with that aileron up here uh, destroying uh, some lift over there and creating more lift over here and and rolling the glider to the right and you can do the same with the left okay um, and then we get into dive brakes are on the wings and you can see kind of the uh, profile picture here of dive brakes dive brakes are basically they can be some type of metal or a composite material that will come up out of the top of the wing and the bottom of the wing so destroying lift on the top and then creating drag on the bottom okay um, in the in the 233 and also so our dive brake um, and I've got a, in the next slide I've got a picture um, it's just a it's it's just a handle over here on the left and you'll pull it back okay and so in the halfway back they'll be halfway open all the way back they'll be full open and there's a, there's like a notch you hit and then if you go over that notch you start to um, actuate the wheel brake of the glider so for when you're landing yeah kind of yeah exactly yeah, sometimes teaching some people that want to grab that and treat it as a throttle that will have them sit on their left hand yeah great question um, the so then spoilers are generally only on the top okay so we're just kind of getting into terminology here so die brake means you got the the, the uh, spoiler and the brakes on the bottom and then the spoiler on the top um, and then flaps um, so flaps are generally closer into the uh, fuselage and they extend your wing out so that you can you can fly at a slower speed okay um, none of our gliders have flaps there are some club members that have a gliders that have flaps um, and in gliders uh, also with flaps um, you can put them up and create um, negative drag and increase airspeed um, Tim O'Donnell one of our club members has a STEMI S10 glider it's a pretty sweet glider and uh, his his glider will do that questions about anything here I did have I did have one uh, I threw one little picture up here on the right um, and if you accidentally are sitting there on the runway getting ready and you're go taking off or you're in the air and your spoilers come out the tow pilot he'll kind of just fan his he'll fan his uh, rudder at you saying hey your spoilers are open do any of the club gliders have tow brakes or are they all 
I don't know. I don't think any of them do. Uh, the L33's got a uh, like a handbrake like this instead of on the spoiler, so this one's actually on the the stick. I wonder if this will let me do this. Nope, I gotta come out. Okay, so landing gear, um, it's fixed in the 233, which is nice. Um, you don't have to remember to put it down. Uh, most importantly, thing important thing is keep it properly inflated. Um, you know, uh, there's a skid on the bottom here um, that after you land on the wheel and you're coming down to a stop, you can you'll stop up on the skid. Um, we occasionally have to replace that with a with a ski, usually from uh, from Corey's garage, and um, the, there's there's a tailwheel on the back of this plane, but it's not for landing on. It's just both, mostly for moving. We have wings. Uh, a lot of the gliders are like that. They're just the wheel on the back is really for uh, just kind of moving or after you've landed resting on it. Uh, there you'll find wings out, uh, or sorry, small wheels, wings or wingtip wheels out on the end. Um, which are used for after you land when you land a glider you want to keep it the wings as level as possible and then after you come to a stop let it rest over um these these wing tips these wing wheel tips they're not you when you go to learn to uh, help people take off they're not for holding on to you know when you when you're running along with the glider and we'll get into all that later but when you're running along with a glider you really just want to kind of just let it rest in your hand so don't hold on to the, the wingtip wheels there um here's the brake or here's the uh, actuator for the the spoiler the die brakes and uh, then again that all the way back will actuate the, the brake do not land with the brake on <laughs> Little things to learn now. All right. Questions about this? This is all straightforward. Um, so the tail, um, it has the vertical stabilizer, um, which is here. And uh, that's a wing in itself, which we'll get into next week. And then right behind it is connected is the rudder, which helps yaw the plane in the vertical axis to the left or right. Um, that's controlled by your pedals, by your feet. Um, these are used in combination with your ailerons to keep the, the plane in coordinated flight, which is efficient flight. We'll talk about that. Um, the horizontal stabilizer right there, sticking out here on Big Orange. And, uh, and then the elevator behind it. So the stick, when the stick goes forward, this goes down. The stick comes back, this goes up, pitching us around the lateral axis. Okay. And some airplanes then have uh, trim sources, um, which help with that pressure on the elevator, relieving pressure once you get to an airspeed that you want. Any questions about that? We'll talk more about how this stuff works aerodynamically next week but just because some of the questions coming up with the instruments start to ask a few things about this wanted to go through it for any of those that haven't been in a plane yet pretty basic stuff i know so here's your primary instruments okay compass yaw string airspeed indicator altimeter and then the variometer and total energy compensators all right here's so we start with the magnetic compass, Old Faithful. This is a compass card inside a, it's nicknamed, or they've also called it a whiskey compass. Back in the day, it was, say it was in some type of alcohol. Um, and it's on a pin that spins. And the uh, this part, when you're looking at the compass, this is actually this is actually so the uh, you know so this is a round piece in here it's always hard to explain and there's there's two magnets in here and the south magnet the south pole part is always facing towards the north right so and this spins on the pin um 
and essentially, really, you kind of, as a glider, you turn around it. That's not the pin I made this with. It's this one, right? So you're you're essentially are always turning around this thing as the glider, because the, the the south pole is always kind of facing towards the north, right? Yeah. Oh, it's um, fluid, warm days, cold days. Yeah. So to a little bit more about that, I guess, since you asked about it. Yeah, um, there's, there's, we're going to learn there's different things in in the glider that affect the magnets and so you got these compensating screws on it that will kind of help turn it and um and it depends on the on the magnet some are pretty fancy some aren't but uh um but yeah that's for the expansion of temperature or compression so again we get into how does it fail the, the magnetic compass doesn't really fail um but we start with deviation errors okay so and these are these are magnetic fields in the plane that can affect the reading of your compass such as the metal bars that make up the compass the um any radios you bring into a compass you know take your handheld radio when you get in there and hold up hold it up to it and see what it does right um in your power uh, or your motor gliders or your power planes um, components of the engines and things like that can affect this and so what they'll do or what you can make a compass card um, if it's a required instrument for your aircraft then you have to do this and basically you go to an airfield that's got a compass rose out on the field and it um, they get corrected every once in a while because you know as 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 magnetic north ch changes once in a while. But anyway, you take it up there, you point it towards magnetic north, um, and then the plane, and you go and sit inside. And in this one, you can see if you want to fly north, you really fly three, five, six, right? So and then they point it towards each main azimuth. And uh, as this one has on there, north zero four five east, and you and you write down what the correction is. Magnetic variation. <clears throat> so again, magnetic north and true north are not in the same place. Um, magnetic north is currently here in Ellsmore Island, Canada. Say what? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> so, and True North is sitting. I think uh, when I I was, it was more you know up here in the Atlantic. So I know if you're like in Ohio. You know, you've got a straight shot as far as like less correction. But so on the chart, on our charts, and right here's Hood River. Here's the isogonic line that goes through that shows the correction of if you're reading a, a magnetic compass. And this is says 15 and a half east, right? So if you wanted to go, if you wanted to go north here, you would subtract 15 from from 360 there and that's the direction you would go but we'll get into the last the last class is navigation right so but um but there is a saying east is least west is best so so this is where you'd subtract when you were, would be calculating navigation so we've got deviation we've got magnetic variation Magnetic dip, why all this happens, right? Um, 
the flux lines at the pools. So magnetic dip is a is an error when this compass that's that that you're looking at in the glider, if you were closer to the pools and you would go to make a turn, it, it would want to dip towards the pool. And as we get further away to the equator, there would be less dip. It would be more more level. So if you were flying up around the, the poles here, the, it would dip so much to it that it you wouldn't get accurate readings because it would just be like scraping against the side. However, the in the, the construction of the magnetic compass, the this you know the center of gravity of this lays so low that it kind of takes out some of that air. The worst part, yeah, yeah. Supposedly, I've never flown up by the pole, so that's just I'm just going from what I've read. So that's fair, right? Um, all right. So, and these are here. We get into a little bit more where they start to like to ask the questions on the test, the uh, the written test, right? So, acceleration errors in the northern hemisphere. They've got we've got an acronym here, ANS: accelerate north, decelerate south. So if you're on a it's most uh, pronounced on headings east or west. So if if uh, you're in your glider and you decide and you're heading towards the the Dalles and you decide to go do a loop and you take a you accelerate by d taking a dive, then the the compass is gonna it's gonna want to swing a little bit more towards the north the north the north and that's really right. And then if when you come back and slow up. The compass will hit, swing a little bit more towards the south. The reading. Is, is that because the compass is way on the south side? No, I think what happens, or my opinion of what I think happens is right. So if we're looking at the Dalles east, right? As I think you go, and I think it's more of a a swing of the fluid or the inert. I mean, I mean the compass is wanting to stay with north, right? But you know, like, uh, I think it's an inertia thing, right? Because you're moving, if you're moving like that, I think it wants to stay with north that way. I think that's why. And so that looks like that's swinging. Yeah, that's what I think. Does anyone else have an opinion on that? I mean, we'll have to, you know, let's get a glider out and go find out, right? <laughs> Um, exactly. So, um, I was thinking about this one on the way here because I don't know if I like this graphic to explain it. It makes sense to me when I think about it, and then I look at this graphic and it doesn't make sense to me. No, it's it's quite small actually, but but if you're expecting one thing and it starts to do a little bit different, and then it comes swings back around, right? Exactly. Yes. Yes. The um, so the turning area, right? Undershoot north or overshoot south is one way to think about it, or north opposite south, exaggerated, right? So if we're looking, we're looking at Mount Adams, and we go to turn to the right, it'll make a f initial turn. Oh, that seems right to me. Hmm. Turn from the north. Yeah, because the compass is right. more it's reading a higher number. Exactly. Exact yeah, that's right. So but then as you keep turning it it, it catches back up to you. Okay, so, um, and then when you go to turn from the south, it'll actually lead your turn. Okay, so it'll, it'll appear that it's turning a little bit faster than what you're turning. Okay, um, so, the, the, yes, Bernard. Does that change by hemisphere? It does. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, 
the um, the the big take home thing is it's it's most accurate when you're in level flight. The magnetic compass. Okay. That yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, some of the fun questions to think about this now, right? In the northern hemisphere, a magnetic compass will normally indicate initially a turn toward the east if an aircraft is decelerated while on a south heading, an aircraft is decelerated while on a north heading, a left turn is entered from a north heading. C. In the North Hemisphere, a magnetic compass will normally, let's see here, yeah, right, exactly. Correct. No, no, that's just, that's just what it starts to do first. Exactly. That's your answer. Yeah. I mean, I mean, so, you know, th this here is what you're going to go take in the written, right? And, and this is, you know, this is just, I mean, this stuff, like I said, you get the book, you pound it out, make sure you, you know, you understand it and stuff and pound it out. But um, what will happen with this section? That's a great question. So, so Ian kind of, they're asking, uh, or for anyone else listening on the, the webinar, what the question was, was what depth of explanation do you have to give to the examiner? And, and in this section, when I got, quizzed on this section it was because I was already a power pilot it was he, the examiner gave me the choice and said pick three systems on this glider that are not on a power plane and explain how they worked right so that was you know I went for the Austrian right away right I mean <laughs> And for once, something cheap too, in aviation, a piece of yarn, and um, and and then of course, then I went for the uh, variometer, um, but and uh, which the variometer is a little more complicated. So he asked me all kinds of questions about that, and um, I don't remember what the other thing was. But um, being a private pilot, he they'll probably the variometer they'll probably almost always ask about um, but uh, um, they'll just choose three systems just kind of really make sure you know about it a lot of times the examiner is gonna there's gonna be something they want to kind of teach you because that's how these guys are they're not supposed to teach you on check rides but they're gonna choose three things that they really think is important and they're gonna just find out what you know about it and then discuss it with you and um, they're not out to get you you know, I mean, these questions are, you know, are kind of nitpicky, but um, this is really just under making sure you kind of understand the errors. But, you know, in the on your check ride when you're flying, that was another thing. I'm glad you asked that question. When you're when you're using the compass, it's going to be you're going to have to do some you're going to have to do like a couple steep 360 degree turns. And it's and it's really watching the compass. Uh, or it's really watching where you took off from did the turn and try to land within 10 degrees of where you took off from. But if you do it visually, you're going to be dead on, you know. Um, um, but just so that's um, we're, we're not going to set you up for failure. But I mean, it's not that like it's not, you know, you, you can make errors in it. Right. I mean, and, and work your way through it. Does that kind of answer your question?
Um, is this the second one? In the northern hemisphere, a magnetic compass will normally indicate a turn toward the north if an aircraft is decelerated while on an east or west heading. We know that's wrong, right? The left turn is entered from a west heading. An aircraft is, yes, we know, yeah, okay. So, yeah, that explains that one. And the last one. What should be the indication on the magnetic compass as you roll into a standard rate to the right from a south heading in the northern hemisphere? So you're heading south, you're heading towards Mount Hood, and you roll into the right. So without looking at an answer, just knowing the compass, I know that that is going to lead. That's gonna, that compass is going to lead me. So I'm going to be looking for some type of answer, right? The compass will initially indicate a turn to the left. That would be if I was turning that away from the north. So it's not going to be A. The compass will indicate a turn to the right, but at a faster rate. That's my answer. Right. So that's the way to kind of think of those, you know. Exactly. Correct. Okay. Correct. Because that's what the mag. That's what. That's what. That's what this. The way the compass was designed. That's what it's going to want to do. Because it wants to stay. You know, essentially, you uh, you are traveling around this inside the glider, essentially, right? Because it's this free floating compass, and so that's just. It's just. It's just this magnet in fluid, and it's just talking about why does it do these peculiar things. So that's all these questions are. Okay, so spend a little time with them. Um, and like I said, pounding, pounding through the, the, the question book, you'll get through just fine. All right, so here we are, the Austrian, the miniature windsock. All right, so yeah, the relative windsock. I, I also meant to put that on here too. I was, um, all right, so basically, are you flying straight through the air, air or are you flying sideways through the air? So are you being efficient or not efficient? As gliders, pilots, soaring pilots, we want to become a, as efficient as possible, right? Um, so if this string is straight back at you, you are flying coordinated. And what's that mean, right? So if you're flying straight, that just, that just means whatever. Whatever direction you're going in, your your rudder and your your ailerons, your rudder, everything's lined up for whatever that flight configuration is, and it's straight. Now, if I want to talk about, so some of this, like I said, I'm not trying to get into aerodynamics tonight, but if you go to make a turn, let's say to the right, and you go to turn a plane, like I said, remember, I lay the stick over to the right. The right aileron goes up, the left aileron goes down to get a roll. If I don't do anything with my feet, this thing will turn right, but the tail will just kind of fall through it like that. And we call that a slip, like you're slipping through the air and you're kind of going around like this. What I should be seeing is like that, kind of see the difference there, right? And so if we're in a slip, that string, instead of coming straight back at you in the cockpit like this, is going to be going this way, okay? And that's a slip. There are times where you're going to learn we want to do a slip on purpose, but when we're trying to, when we're up there and we want to get up high and look at our houses and stuff, whatever we want to do up there, we're slipping that. We don't want that, okay? So how do you fix it? You fix it with rudder. and Right here, if we're slipping through, if we we're slipping, this, the yaw string would be over here because the relative wind would be carrying it over here. And the trick to this is think of it as an arrow, whereas this is the point, and it's really, it's pointing to this right foot, right? Hey, 
dummy step on the right foot and it'll straighten out and then you start going around like that correct correct yep it's opposite of the ball so for you power guys it's opposite of the ball <laughs> i like it so now skidding is the other way you're going into that right turn except you're throwing that tail out there just like skidding the car around right and then when you get into that situation the yaw string is going to be coming back by you this way right because the relative wind is going to be coming that way too much rudder good job true or not enough aileron <laughs> so i love this um skids skids are red flags for me when we get low and slow skids are dangerous we'll, we'll learn about that later okay so anyway i have to kind of just start to introduce this because of some of the questions you're going to get here and we haven't got in the aerodynamics um questions thoughts concerns yes bernard No, it's less dangerous. Was the question, it's less dangerous? Or is, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, we'll get into that. Okay, so here's the other, here's the other part of that, the inclinometer, which our plane has both, you got the yaw and the ball. All right, so are you flying through the air sideways, air straight? Air straight or sideways? Here it is down on the bottom. So the way it works, it's just a metal ball in, in a little tube of oil or kerosene. And, um, and so if you're slipping, gravity just takes it to the right. The ball falls to the right. If you're right in the middle, if you're straight back, it's in the middle, as you can see there. And if you're skidding, it'll swing over to the left. Okay, in a right-hand turn. And it's a lag instrument. So when you're flying, eyes out. Let it, Once you get into a turn, then it'll settle where it needs to be. But this is a lag instrument. Most of our instruments, well, I shouldn't say that. Let's, we'll stay right with this one. Um, okay. Yeah. String is right. Yep. Yeah, that's true. Good point. So how does it fail? It tangles up, you know. You'll get all strapped into the glider. Everybody's got you hooked up. The wind guy's out there, and then the string, like, some crazy gust of wind wraps it around there, and you're like, uh, you know, come back out, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and a lot of, um, so Ian, there, you don't know this, Corey, but there's people on this on the other side that can't hear because of the mics. Um, but so anyway, the question was about adverse yaw. We were explaining adverse yaw, what happens if uh, you throw in aileron and you don't throw in rudder. And um, so this all leads to this uh, uncoordinated flight. Correct. So when you do go to make the right turn, left turn, whatever turn you want, when you do it, you want to put, you want to push on your rudder, your right rudder with it, right? And matching. So match. So, so that's how you get into the skid, right? So when you make a turn, a roll and bank, um, if you put in too much right rudder during that turn, right? So, I mean, when you get up there and start learning to fly, you're going to make all these errors. You're not going to put enough rudder in right away, or you're going to put too much rudder in 
right? I mean, most people, I think, initially don't put enough in because they're a little timid. They don't know what the glider does. And then they start to learn or it gets a little windy. And then that's when they start putting too much rudders in because they start pushing a lot. Well, it there can be. If, yeah, absolutely. So if you're the the question is, is there any pitch coupling to the to the yaw? So if you're doing a, a steep turn, which you'll be required to do for your check ride, um, a 45, 50 degree angle steep turn, um, you'll you'll need to pull back some on that turn. And most most turns do require some type of slight uh, pulling back in your pitch. And then when you come out of them, re releasing that or even a press forward a little bit. Correct. Well, we'll get into that. that this is next week. That's why I didn't want to go too far down the subject yet. Right, I'm just trying to do systems. Like I, I was re looking at all the stuff today. I was like, there's so many ways we can get into system, or we can get into aerodynamics and operations, you know. So, um, um, okay. So here's here's how these questions come about. Figure eleven: Which yaw string and inclinometer illustrations indicate a slipping right turn? So let's first look for the yaw string, right? Slipping, we're falling through the turn, right? So we don't have enough rudder in. And which which one is it? We know it's not one, because that's straight back, that's coordinated. We know it's not. So let's let's just just let's just deal with the yaw string first. So is it two or three? Good job, right? Because we're following through, so that wind's coming this way. And then if we look at the ball, we're, so two and six. Exactly. All right, two and six. So you get that chance to answer that. Here's the dangerous one. The skid. Which of the illustrations depicts the excessive use of right rudder during the entry of a right turn? So we know it's not one, we know it's not two, so it must be three, right? So we're skidding around, and then which which inclinometer? Four, good. Okay. All right, three and four. Um, intentionally to do a skid, if maybe you're practicing aerobatics or you're wanting to maybe go and practice spin or practice upset training with with an instructor up high. No, no. Yeah, great use for a slip, as you'll learn. All right, so airspeed indicator. Okay, so on front of big orange here, we've got this pitot tube. We've got a couple tubes here, actually. And um, so this is ram air pressure. So as, as the glider starts getting pulled, air starts getting rammed in there. And um, And then last week we talked about Static ports being on the plane. Um, static ports are just holes that can be um, they can be on the side of fuselages. Um, on this one, it's actually on this bottom on this bottom tube, and um, obviously that's just reading the static pressure. So that's that's the one top one is the, uh -huh. the, the bottom on this one. Yeah, it's long on the side, and um, it, it's just a couple holes there drawn behind the washer. And um, so the way this works, you know, you've got your 
you've got your static pressure in here and your pedo or your ram air pressure comes in there and then just the difference of that moves this and it gives you an indicated airspeed very simple right um talk about failure uh you don't take the cover off right it happens um a leak this you know the cool thing about learning gliders before you get into power and stuff is like like some of the stuff in gliders i mean this is in planes too right but it's like some of these tubes they're just they're plastic and things wear out or something gets drilled into them or whatever right um so they could leak water could get in them here's a story from our youth member I was flying the 233 in a light rain shower, and I noticed the airspeed would occasionally drop to zero. I assume it was water momentarily clogging the pitot tube. It only lasted a few seconds at most, so it wasn't an issue. But if I if it but if it had lasted longer, I knew what airspeed I was trimmed for, and I could also tell by the sound roughly how fast I was going. Um, so here he had a failure, and the cool thing about gliders is we're visual. And uh, you you really do learn the basics of flying just by you know stick and rudder, hands and feet, listening, hearing the sound, and um, if if you do have that failure, no big deal, you know you'll you'll get back, you'll be okay. Um, so uh, let's see here, what else about this? Um, We want to clean, keep these ports clean and and open. Um, uh, just and then and then it's good to calibrate these. Uh, we I don't know if we have calibrated Big Orange this past year, but it, it, we should get it calibrated. Um, we sometimes do it against the tow plane because like you'll be like, um, what's your what are you indicating up there uh, i'm 60 what do you got i'm 65 but we don't know who's right so <laughs> now if uh, when we first when the club first started it one of we were using a a, a tow plane that had a gps in it so i was able to sometimes figure out you know who was right or what was going on with that um okay I agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. There, there's definitely an error there, and so the, um, that kind of gets us into the corrected airspeed. This second part here, right? So, again, what you're reading on the airspeed indicator is your indicated airspeed. Okay, and next week or this in two weeks we're going to get into performance of aircraft and talking about all these v speeds and so we're going to get into you know best lift over drag and stall speeds vs or vso is really your what's your stall speed in your landing configuration and uh and then you've got minimum sink speeds and maneuvering speeds and never exceed speeds, right? Aero toe speeds. So we'll be talking about all that with Big Orange and some other planes and looking at some polars and material. Um, other air speeds that you, you'll come across against or come across in the the glider flight manuals and different books are your calibrated airspeed and this is airspeed that's corrected um, from installation or high angle of attacks and things like that um, another airspeed that you can be questioned about is true airspeed which as we go up in our atmosphere you know in the past couple of weeks we were talking about weather and how pressure decreases and density can decrease as we go up that for every thousand foot um, a pr true airspeed increases 2%. So I put this chart in here, which I find interesting, is you could be in a glider um, at 10,000 feet, its stall speed is 40 knots, um, your true airspeed is 48 knots, and then you go up to 48 to 40,000 feet, stall speed's 40 knots, 
but your true airspeed 72 knots. Um, and then here's another example down here for your V and E, which is your never exceed speed. Uh, 6,500 is 135 knots. Um, you know, then you go up to 16,500, it's 115 knots. I was kind of calculating the speeds the other night for, for big orange, right? Because, like, it's V and E is uh, 98, and uh, maneuver speeds 65. So, I mean, it you get up to 10,000. 16,000, its window closes real quick. VSO is defined as the stalling speed or minimum steady flight speed in the landing configuration. Stalling speed or minimum steady flight speed in a specified configuration, that's VSO1. We didn't you haven't really learned those yet, or maybe you have, but we didn't really discuss it there. And then stalling speed or minimum takeoff speed. So this one is A. So there's a few few speeds that they they may ask you about. Big orange, you could probably argue VSO and VS is the same speed, you know, unless you would say or you could argue for big orange VSO because generally you try to land with half um, half spoiler out. So VSO would probably be half spoiler out would be the landing configuration. And then with spoilers fully closed would be VS speeds. So in the early, in the early 40s, the FAA went to a color-coded uh, airspeed indicator they required all airspeed um and to have a, a color code um with a with a white green yellow and red arc ours only has a green and a red because we don't have flaps flaps is a for anytime you have white indicator that's for flaps and then um yellow is a caution caution range and big orange i guess goes right from green to to never exceed. Um, so the again, the white arc would be the flat flap operating range, which um, the bottom of the white arc would be stall speed uh, at straight and level flight with flaps and landing gear extended at full gross weight. Um, the t so that means the top of the white arc would be your max flap operating speed. Um, the green arc, normal operating range. So the bottom of the green arc would be our stall speed at straight and level flight at full gross weight. And then the top of the green arc would be our structural cruising speed, normal operation in calm air. And then yellow, if you are flying a glider, has yellow arc. Obviously, that's going to be caution range, smooth air, only limited control movements. And then the, the red line, obviously, never exceed. OK, so um, the altimeter. All right, another static pressure instrument. Um, so it's got a little aneroid barometer in there, and it's basically pe uh, closed pressurized at 29.92 inches of mercury, right? And so as the glider goes up and the pressure, you know, decreases, which we talked about as we create decreases about a thousand about a inch per thousand feet, that just starts that little bellows starts to just opens up like that and starts to show us um, how high we go. Um, the little thing, this is your, the little arm here is your 10,000. Um, this one's your thousand and this is your hundreds. So as far as reading it goes, um, pretty intuitive once you start reading it. Um, it's got a Colesman window here, so when you're working with your non-standard temp and pressure, which we always are, this is your correction. So call into the Hood River AWOS, right? We talked about the AWOS and the METAR last week, and uh, find out what the pressure is for the station and um, move that pressure uh, to the station. And it should be, should give you, in Hood River, it should give you pretty close to uh, 600 and... 28 feet, 630 feet. If a glide, if a if the 
if the altimeter is off more than 75 feet, then it really should be serviced, right? Um, but we're not doing instrument flying here, so you can just go ahead and crank it to six to 600. I have on the on the the two five end where we launch. I have all the students, or I have you put it at 600 feet. At the other end, I have you put it at 630 feet. There's a uh, small slope to the field. This reading right here. Oh, sure. Um, what do you think it is? Oh, gotcha. You know what? I digital's awful. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Maybe when you get it, maybe if you're flying a 737, it's a beautiful thing, but. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is 1,200 feet. So this little guy here is pointing at 1,000, and this is pointing at your hundreds or two hundreds. Is no, no, no. I understand. So, and that's because the, the thousand is more than sun. Right, it's exactly. It's, so, you only read that for energy or something. Yeah. 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 So, there again, there we were. If there's no, if you don't know what the pressure is at the field, you can always just set it to the field elevation. Okay, again, keep your static ports clean. Um, so again, this is your indicated altitude. Okay, and so we're gonna start defining some more terms here. So true altitude is distance from the glider to mean sea level, okay? And so um, um, things on charts as we get into chart out, looking into chartology and stuff on the last class, uh, we'll, talk a lot about what matters as far as mean sea level and uh, above ground level. Um, and then, so let's get into a little bit the altimeter here um, into some of our possible errors or things that could happen, right? So kind of a little scenario I wanted to like throw in here about, so how does the altimeter work? So here we are, uh, you're in Hood River, you're at 600 and 600 feet, you're taking off at 11 a.m. The pressure was 29.92. You took off, you got off tow at the notch. So the notch is a notch in a hill. I know some of you can see that look. You're like, every time you hear a term, you don't know, I get this look, right? So a notch is a, is a physical place in the hill, right? You'll, you, you'll, you'll, that's part of the fun of all this, right? Once you get past all this, Gotcha. Okay. Well, there's a lot of local. So anyway, you get off at the notch, 2,500 feet. You go out for a couple hours. You know, the notch looks nice and low. Or, I mean, it, you know, there's the notch. You come back at 2 p.m. And now you're at 2,500 feet indicated and you're looking a little low. You're by the notch. You're the same spot. What happened? Exactly, a, you know, a, a, it could have warmed up, cold pressures, you know, cold system came in, you know, but the definitely the pressure changed, right? And, but you're, you're, bare, yes, and you never, but you never changed, you know, you never called in and listened to the station, so right? Absolutely, absolutely, right? Um, and so, you know, the same, from high to low, look out below, right? Correct. Possibly, yes. Exactly, exactly. Or you go to another area, right? You go up to the valley and it's a different, you got a different temperature, you got a different system going on, you know? That's what's so neat about, like, um, what we do, we're just, we're dealing with such little microclimates. That's what really like gets me about this. I just got this book in the mail too, is, um, uh, oh, what is it? I meant to, I'll email it to you. You guys, you know, um, 
it's a guy who did a lot of paragliding and he wrote this excellent book, but it's also applies to, um, gl uh, gliding and everything. Um, but it's super great weather book. Um, so then our, our second one here, altimeter, uh, let's assume, uh, constant pressure. Um, it's a nice hot July. You take off at 4 PM, you get off the notch again, 2,500 feet. You come back at 8 PM. You're indicating 2,500 feet again, but you're lower. What happened? Assuming constant pressure. Temperature. Temperature. It cooled off. Okay, so the density went down. Um, it's going to... You're going to get asked these questions. How do variations in temperature affect the altimeter? So A, pressure levels are raised on warm days and the indicated altitude is lower than the true altitude. Higher temperatures expand the pressure levels and the indicated altitude is higher than the true altitude. We know that doesn't happen. Lower temperatures lower the pressure levels and the indicated altitude is lower than the true altitude. A. So on a warm day, and the explanations are there, when you study your questions, these are all in there. More altitude definitions. So absolute altitude, this is your above ground level altitude, vertical distance from the glider to the, the ground or above. So these are, we'll use these later for glide calculations. Pressure altitude, the altitude indicated when the altimeter window is set Adjusted 2992. So that's another way to find out the pressure sitting there in your glider. Just go ahead and turn it to 2992 and see what actual altitude you get from the indication, right? Right, exactly. And then there's density altitude, um, which we talked about in the first weather le lecture and how to use this chart. So your pressure altitude corrected for variations from standard temperature, right? So the temperature is above standard, the density altitude is going to be higher than the pressure altitude, vice versa. And this is where we'll, we'll talk about performance, right? Because thinner, hotter, higher density altitudes, uh, the poorer performance you're going to get out of your, your glider or airplane, especially a power plane. What is density altitude? Height above the standard datum plane? The pressure altitude corrected for non-standard temperature. The altitude read directly from the al altimeter. Correct. The vario, <clears throat> where the fun happens, right? Why we're up there trying to find lift. Um, so um, for you power guys, you're, you're familiar with a VSI or vertical speed indicator. So a vertical speed indicator just obviously it will show you your rate of, of, of climb. Um, and this is like, the way the instrument works is like a VSI. Um, this actually measures the rate of change of static pressure and expresses it as knots per minute. So if you do the calculation on knots per minute, it's like a 101 point something feet, right? So it's basically 100 feet a minute. Um, so it's, there's a, when you look down here, some people want to know the NAT, you know, the inner workings of a NAT's ass. So um, when you get down into here, so the, the variometer kind of has this sealed flask, right? And so when you're sitting on the ground and static pressure, so this is all the same. And then as you go up to change, it, it actually measures the, the change of the flow rate right here. So it's, it's super quick, right? And uh, and so you can trick it. And you know, when you're in the air, you can trade your, your potential energy into some kinetic energy and trick it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. No, but that's, well, 
True. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Nope. Yeah. It's just knots. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Oh, this one. Great question. So um, this one has an electric sensor. So, I mean, it's still, it, this one, it still uses all these components, but the sensor here is electric. So it, 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 um, um, it, it's just more sensitive. It just, we'd have to get the manual out. For that specific variometer. Correct. Um. So to help compensate against um, stick thermaline gliders use total energy compensation. Uh, so on on he, on ours, it has. So what you're trying to do, right, is because you. This has a, how do I explain this? Um, so we've got our pitot tube, we've got our static tube, and on the back of our, on the front of our static tube is a, it's almost like a washer put on there, right? And so, and then the, the holes are behind it, and that kind of creates a Venturi type of setup. So, you know, as, if you were to push down, right, and you're actually taking your glider through an atmosphere that's going to, the pressure is going to increase, but you're speeding, you're speeding up, right? So, but this here, because you're creating that Venturi situation, that pressure goes down, so it, it kind of like offsets the, the, the stick thermal. Now in big orange, you can still really kind of create it and trick it, but it, but it helps it. And more advanced gliders have better systems that do this better, that read what the atmosphere is doing better, um, or it's changing. That's what I'm trying to say. So um, total, you know, you get into these netto systems and and they get much more complex. I mean, as far as what you guys will need to explain is just how this this works you know and and total energy compensation but when you get in um because that's what's on your glider right so when it comes to the exam and so these get so like in the l33 it's actually it's got one that it beeps at you so as you are climbing you hear beep 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 beep, beep and then and so you're able to start looking outside now even more instead of watching the tool um, and some of the guys in the club that have pretty advanced gliders their their barriers do all kinds of things it'll trace how far back the thermal was if they wanted to circle or this and that and um, they're they're really quite neat instruments those are our primary instruments secondary instruments um, so our big orange doesn't have an electrical system. If you do get into a glider that has one, um, just become familiar with it. Okay. Um, when you start working with the club and, uh, working out on the field, I highly suggest you get a handheld glider so you can know what's coming in or what's going out. And, um, you know, I'll do a little workshop on, um, radio calls and things. Um, You don't, you, at one time you did, 
you don't anymore. The aero acronym that we learned for the uh, the plane you, uh, used to have uh, R on it, a uh, second R for radio license. You don't need one anymore. Nope, they got rid of it. Now, I think if you go to Canada, you still have to get one. Yeah, okay. And Europe, yeah. Yep, so. Nope, they got rid of all that. They made it simpler. Um, but with the radio, especially a handheld radio in the cockpit, um, there's a there's a saying, aviate, navigate, communicate. Um, don't get distracted by the radio, right? Sometimes if you're flying or you get into the pattern and there's a lot of radio chatter and maybe that's bothersome to you, turn the radio down, you know, fly the plane, okay? So early messages as far as just always be flying the plane. Um, motor gliders will have electric systems. Um, some of our, you know, our L33 and our 126, um, and these are the these are the single seat planes that as soon as you're you're soloing in big orange, we're going to move you over to these planes. So you will will start working with um, gliders that have little radio rechargeable systems in them. Um, and so so obviously some of these electrical systems will power um, electrical varios or other transponder equipment. The uh, L33 has a transponder, right? I think it has a transponder. So transponders, again, we've talked about that briefly, I think in class one, um, that they, you know, they are used to to ping ATC and let them know where we are. Um, it's a, so mode C altitude encoding, um, uh, if you ever would decide to go up into the flight levels and uh, want to use the transponder, you would do 1202, which is the VFR frequency. Most people are doing 1200, but the um, FCC or the FAA likes us to use 1202, and that recognizes you as a glider. Um, if you get on board with uh, some type of flight following, you know, up in the wave window or something, they may give you a, a four digit that's just unique to you. Um, as you're changing through those, don't accidentally change to 7500, because that means you were hijacked. Um, if you do get lost, you can put it on 7600. Or actually, sorry, that's lost comms. If you if you if your radio breaks, you could put it put it on 7600, and they'll know you can't talk to them. And if you have some type of emergency, you can go to 7700. <laughs> it is. Um, but just become fa familiar with your system. All right. Avionics, so uh, you're not going to get really tested on this in any form of way um, other than um, how much bling is in your glider. So I put a couple interesting things up here. Um, some of the club members are carrying this. Uh, this thing is also called an OD. Um, it's a way of kind of tracking where you've been. Um, it's, you know, it's a movable map. It's a GPS. Um, there's, if you get into club fly or get into the club, there's tasks we can do and you, this can track those tasks. You can upload, the, upload those as our club grows. I'm hoping to see members start um, playing with these things more. Um, but there's a lot of cool, fun things we can do as a club with these little toys. Um, the one Tim O'Donnell I mentioned has a STEMI. Um, his glider is not this blinged out. This is a pretty, here's some pretty, no, this is a, this is a STEMI uh, S, this is an S, uh, 10, S12 here. He has an S10 glider. This is an, this is an S12. Um, you can see it's total glass panel. Um, so I'm sure this has moving maps, your gyro instruments, all digital. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, and then, uh, but, or you can go down as small as a nice vario like this. This is one of the little video, ver digital varios I was telling you about that, uh, you know, um, will have all the beeping sounds, track your true speed, your altitude. Um, things like that. Um, I carry a spot just in case I, even when I'm just hiking, I carry this thing just in case, uh, you can push SOS and the sheriff's department will come. If you're on the coast, the coast guard will come. Um, 
but or if I don't make it back to the field, I don't know. I just feel good having that on me. Anyway, that's that's a little piece of avionic. Um, G meter. Um, you probably won't be tested on this, but it is a secondary instrument. Uh, a couple of our gliders have it. Um, so straight and level on accelerated flight, uh, you will be about a 1G load inverted. Um, straight and level on accelerated, you're a negative 1G load. Um, that's a picture of when I was just down in Arizona um, doing some aerobatic training. Um, most of them have this three arm um, here showing you the one that you're active on and then the max and min that the last flight had gone on. Um, so before you take over a plane, you kind of want to know how much load someone was putting on a plane. Um, so turbulence can, as we were talking about earlier, cause excessive uh, G load. Um, and we'll talk about this next week, but fly VA. So VA is a maneuvering speeds, um, which is basically if you get into a turbulence situation, you want to try to fly straight and level and get the plane slow, slowed down to whatever the VA speed. And in the big orange glider, it's 65. OK. Um, if you're ever trailering a glider that has a G meter, lock it so it, so it doesn't uh, damage the sensors. Here's kind of the schematics. It's hard to find a schematics of a G meter inside. I searched and searched and searched and searched and found this. I don't even know which one it belongs to, but anyway, so that's neither here nor there. Um, oxygen equipment. They love to ask questions about oxygen equipment. Um, the DPEs do, um, and uh, but it, it may be something you see. And some of our gliders do have oxygen, and we, and you could use it here. Um, so there's a regulation around oxygen, right? And that's one reason they like to ask about it. But uh, so you will get questions likely from your DPE about this. They're simple. They'll just be like. You know, the regulation says above 12,500 feet up to 1,400 feet, you can be up there without oxygen for no more than 30 minutes. Okay. And then once you go over that, once you're up at 14, you and any other flight crew have to have oxygen. And if you have passengers above that, which you're not going to have in a, in a glider, um, they have to have oxygen available. So I'll get the oxygen equipment you'll have. Um, I have seen this uh, a question on this in the written before, so we'll, we'll go through this. Um, all of these have a regulator, and, and the what I'm going to discuss here is the different types of regulators. You got a continuous flow regula regulator, right? And that's basically you're just turning it on. That's your most. It's your cheapest, but it's just going to. But it's also becomes your most expensive as far as the uh, oxygen because you just turn it on. It comes from a you just put a nasal cannula on or a mask, and it's just going to let the oxygen go. And it's good up to about eighteen thousand uh, feet. Exactly, it's just on. It's on. Yep. And then you get the diluter demand. Um, which is generally more like the mask with the bag, and it's got a sensor that, as you inhale, it keeps the oxygen that's already diluted in the bag regulated, so it wastes a little bit less, and it's good up to about 35,000 uh, feet. The questions, if you get these on the written, um, they don't, they're, they are not this specific about, they, they, yeah, they're not this specific about the height they're more about how it works so um and the in the how they work is pretty much in the name pressure demand system so obviously as we're getting uh above 35,000 feet um or we're, we're you get into those ranges there's just not enough actual natural pressure to push the oxygen into your body so it's got to be the pressure demand system it's just going to pretty much just push it into you Fitted mask, yep, and that's why I had that other, yeah, fitted mask. And, um, and then there's a new one out that's an electronic pulse. Um, 
that's uh, kind of taken over for the continuous flow one. But uh, um, make sure you get Aviation O2. Uh, supposedly it has no impurities or water in it, like medical oxygen. But a friend of mine who works at an oxygen place said there's no difference between any of them. But uh, again, make sure you get Aviation O2. Um, but I would suggest if you ever mess with any of this is to have a checklist for how your system works. Um, make sure you test it before flight, Dur have a way during flight to test it, make sure there's wires, you know, aren't getting snagged and kinked and things like that, and that you actually shut it off after flight. Um, so that is, and and we do have uh, our, our one, 26 uh, has an oxygen system in it um, and uh, Paul our founder he's wanting to create an oxygen station um, so it may be something we start seeing more often here coming to the end here gyroscopic instruments none of our gliders have any of these um, you Unfortunately, on the written, for those of you that have to take the written, you may get some questions about gyroscopic instruments. Um, I'll be happy to meet with you on a one-on-one -on -one basis. But these are more for used for um, when you get into instrument conditions, meaning you fly into a cloud, right? So we're not going to be doing that. Um, uh, but just quickly to go through them, an attitude indicator, which is right here, gives you a... Uh, a, a, you know, shows you what the the attitude of your airplane is, and it works. Um, all these work on gyro, the gyroscopic principles of uh, rigidity in space, kind of like the comp. I always think of these as the compass principle. Is like you're you're turning around these, you know, in the plane when you're actually flying, um, and they need a vacuum system to run. So your glider does not, there's nothing on your glider that's going to turn a vacuum system fast enough to run these. Um, and then here's it. They have a, a turn coordinator that's uh, much, much more uh, sensitive and realistic to what your airplane is doing. Um, and then they have a, a heading indicator. So um, this gets more into power stuff, but unfortunately for the written part, you'll see questions. The examiner on your Actual flight day will not ask you a single thing about this. Cool instruments, not for gliders. Um, so next week, aerodynamics. Um, what just questions about instruments? So Thoughts? 